Hello, Algo Ninjas, and welcome to this first live chat on Algo Trading in Quant Finance. Uh, my name is Dr. Tom Stark, and I'm the head of uh, AAA Quants, which is a trading and consultancy company um, that um, trades uh, automatic trading systems and consults people on how to build them and set them up. On the side, I'm also um, making uh, now and then a few videos on specific topics uh, regarding to quant trading. And I also have a course on Udemy called Python for traders and investors. If you're interested, uh, please check that out. And uh, first and foremost, if you would like, um, please um, give us a uh, like or, or subscribe to our channel. Um, and then you can stay updated uh, with all the things uh, that you might be interested in. Um, we will quite frequently post uh, new topics and also on Udemy we will have a few courses which are soon to be um, released uh, on more advanced topics in quantitative trading. One is in futures trading and the other one is in options trading. So uh, without further ado, um, let's get into the live session. And we have a few questions uh, already uh, from uh, our listeners. I just uh, want to read them out uh, and then uh, I will answer them as good as I can. So um, the first question comes from Mohammed, and he asks, uh, do you use technical or fundamental analysis for your trading? All right. Well, the answer is really clear cut. It depends. <laughs> so um, it really is a function of uh, whether you're a retail trader, how much money do you have available, um, you know, or if you are in an institutional setting and so on. Um, and the answer for this can be significantly different. But it also depends on your time frame. So let's just uh, uh, dive into this a little bit deeper. Um, um, what what would I be interested in? Well, first of all, fundamental analysis uh, is something that you would normally trade uh, if you have a view over a longer period of time. So usually uh, fundamental data come out with earnings releases, which is every three months in the US or every six months, for example, here in Australia. And so um, if you want to really trade on these data, you need to have a fairly long time frame in order to do this. Um, so it's not uh, good to use fundamental analysis, for example, if you trade minute by minute. The other problem is uh, recently, um, and this is something you should really be aware of uh, with all the central bank intervention across the world, that um, the prices and the performance of, for example, equities has really been decoupled uh, from their fundamental properties. And, and that could present quite a problem. In the old days, it was clear you had a company that was undervalued. You looked through, um, all the fundamental data, you found the company, and then uh, you invested in it and hoped that at some point in the future, the company would perform much better than its price. Now, this is really not so much the case at the moment, at least, um, since uh, the central bank, specifically the Fed, provides a lot of liquidity and now actively buys um, um, junk bonds, you know, and even starts to buy shares now through uh, their uh, four-letter acronym alphabet soup of programs uh, that they put out. So um, while fundamental analysis is probably still good in the long run, um, it can be quite tricky. Uh, even Warren Buffett uh, right now doesn't know uh, what to buy. He thinks everything is overvalued. And uh, that says quite something. So, so uh, I would be a little bit concerned just right now, uh, if it comes to that, uh, but uh, of course, um, you know, you have to make your own call on it. Now, next, um, what about uh, technical analysis? And so technical analysis is interesting because it can really be um, separated into different areas. There is this technical analysis that people use uh, where they try to recognize patterns in a chart. So, for example, they identify a trend channel or a head and shoulders pattern or something like this. And a lot of the identification of these things, or, or like, for example, Elliott waves, um, a lot of the identification of these things is very much a, a subjective thing. And 
when you look at the chart and you look at it from different um, distances, so from different time frames, you can actually also identify different patterns. And uh, no two technical analysts um, identify the same patterns. Now, um, I'm not saying uh, this is a good or a bad thing, uh, but it's definitely something that is very, very difficult to uh, base your systematic trading on. Um, an interesting story is um, I ran a workshop uh, for the Quantopian, for the, the algo trading uh, platform. And I had a few technical analysts in the workshop and I basically showed them some charts and I said, oh, what? What can you see in these charts? And they said, oh, look, this is uh, an interesting um, triangular pattern. And that's, uh, that's a really strong uh, support line and, and so on, you know, and, and head and shoulders and all that. And then, um, you know, they found all these interesting patterns. And I told them afterwards, hey, this was actually generated uh, randomly by just, just running a Python program. And so they were pretty devastated. I said, look, the, wherever this chart goes has absolutely nothing to do with the pattern you see. Um, they were quite devastated. They thought, wow, this, this is interesting. Now, uh, this doesn't mean it doesn't work um, because certainly um, you can use those patterns specifically if you have a really good, um, a really good understanding of the market. If, if you really know the market and you have worked in it for a long time, you can use those patterns to give yourself an idea of, hey, hey, this, this is what might happen. Um, but that's, again, that's really hard for systematic trading. All right, the, the next point is uh, technical indicators. And again, they're, they're very interesting because technical indicators uh, have one property that makes them a little bit um, difficult. Uh, and this is the fact that they are really lagging uh, behind the real world. So, you know, let's just say uh, we are using a moving average for our trading. Um, if we want to do this, we have to have a look back window and the window looks back a certain amount of time. And the number that we get is composed of all the, uh, all the amounts of time that, that has already passed. And if there's a very big event uh, that will come into the um, moving average, but it doesn't necessarily flow into it right now with the right value. And this could be quite problematic. Uh, and, and so often um, we get these, this lagging behavior. Now, having said that, um, that doesn't mean it's, it's uh, not good because there are definitely technical indicators that give us uh, some sort of uh, good value uh, for money, so to speak. And um, the question is, how could we possibly uh, test uh, the validity, for example, of, of one of the technical indicators that we might be using. So um, I give you a, a very brief um, idea about this. So let's say um, um, you have a technical indicator. So I draw you a chart here. And what you want to do is you want to um, draw the value of the technical indicator and then uh, do a linear regression, for example, and uh, you uh, see uh, whether that value uh, has some sort of correlation to the forward return of your uh, time series. So um, for example, let's say this is our price chart and we have a value of our technical indicator here. We call that uh, V0. And what we want to do is we want to take this value V0 and then uh, and so, so this is actually V0 is not the price, it's, it's, it's the value of our technical indicator at that price. And we want to, for example, say, well, okay, if we have this value, how does this correlate to the return at T0 to, say, T uh, plus 5, okay? So it's basically the return from here to here. All right, I hope you can see this and it's not too small. Um, and so if we do this uh, for many, many um, um, values, so let's say uh, we do this here for V1 and V2 and so on, um, we can then say, well, here we have our V and here we have our forward return. And what we really want to see is a correlation 
between all our values of v and the forward return. So if we f find this correlation uh, between all the values, um, we could say, well, okay, our uh, indicator has some sort of predictive value. I hope that makes sense. Um, and so we, we could, you know, test a lot of indicators um, for their predictive value. Now, um, clearly, if you are a data scientist, the first idea that you will get is, well, um, you know, there's a lot of um, a lot of uh, indicators I can test and a lot of look back windows and combinations of indicators and all that. Now, um, if you do this, you obviously have to be very careful because if you test lots and lots of them, you will always find some that have a really good correlation with each other. And uh, then, you know, you will find that, oh, okay, you use them, but what you're actually doing is just really overfitting um, um, your system. And um, one has to be really careful uh, by doing this. One of the uh, important things that, that you should consider when you use indicators is, does this indicator have some sort of uh, economic relevance? So for example, if you use a, a difference between two moving averages, uh, you could say, well, this has some relevance uh, in terms of uh, an equity or, or a future uh, trending in one or the other direction. So you could say, well, if this is generally a, uh, say a commodity that is trending and that has a trending behavior, we could use the difference of the two moving averages to define this trending behavior. So if you use uh, indicators, I would definitely always advise come up with an economic idea first and then uh, find the indicator that gives you uh, a, an indication of, of how this uh, economic idea plays out, just, just like in the case of the two moving average differences. And uh, that way indicators can be useful. Um, actually, I'm, I'm soon releasing a uh, video on YouTube or series uh, where I show you how to optimize um, parameters of those technical indicators uh, and still maintain an idea about um, your strategy not being overfitted. Um, and that should come out uh, in the next two weeks or so. So stay tuned for that. And I hope you will enjoy this one. Okay, I hope uh, this answers your question. And so uh, um, for this, um, I move on to the next one. Um, and this next question is uh, another one which is fairly um, um, broad and white. Um, and it's by Lachlan. And he asked me, uh, what are the best platforms for quant trading? And what are also the best brokers for quant trading? And um, again, uh, as you probably uh, know, there's a clear cut answer again. <laughs> and the answer is it depends. <laughs> so um, in order to, to answer this, uh, I have to go, first of all, I have to uh, make a disclaimer. Um, whatever uh, platforms or brokers I talk about. I'm, the other thing is that uh, I can mostly talk about platforms that I have used myself. Um, and, you know, you may know a platform which is really excellent. Um, and, you know, you, you say, hey, why isn't he talking about this? And it's just simply because probably I'm not aware of it or I haven't heard of it. There is a really large number of platforms out there. Um, they all have their goods and bads. I have yet to find a platform that is just wonderful and it covers everything. Um, in my opinion, <laughs> this doesn't probably exist and it probably won't exist for quite a long time. Okay, so um, let's just uh, get into this a little bit. Uh, so f again, first of all, uh, if you want to choose a platform that you want to trade on, the question is, um, where are you you're situated in the market? Are you a retail trader? Are you a professional trader uh, that trades in a, say, little hedge fund or prop firm? Or are you a, uh, you know, are you working in a large institution? Um, I guess most of you here uh, will be somewhere in between. They will maybe be in retail or in this sort of small hedge fund or prop trading world. Um, so let's just start with the uh, retail world because oftentimes 
uh, this is where people are most interested because a lot of people um, that get into trading are data scientists and they go, oh yeah, I know the data, but I don't know, um, I don't know where to start, and and it's 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 a really hard uh, it's a really hard to get started, and it was the same for me. Now, there's several ways to get started, um, and it also depends a little bit on what your preference is in terms of what you like to trade, what what asset class. Interestingly, um, there is no trading platform that really covers all the asset classes equally and trades them easily. So you have to make a little bit of a decision. Uh, why would you choose one asset class over the other? So let's say uh, one of the easiest asset classes perhaps to trade is uh, foreign exchange, Forex. Um, and one of the reasons why this is easy to trade is that uh, is that a lot of brokers offer it. Uh, there's a lot of brokers out there that offer foreign exchange trading. And a lot of the time they also um, offer you uh, a platform that is also good for algo trading called MetaTrader. Uh, MetaTrader comes in two flavors, uh, MT4 and MT5, which can both be uh, uh, programmed uh, with a C-like uh, algo language. So Met MetaTrader MT4 is a bit more like C, MT5, uh, the other version is a bit more like C++. Um, if you're used to programming, it can be quite um, tricky to begin with. So you have to go through a lot of documentation. I personally have uh, uh, run a few projects on MT4. I'm not too uh, used to MT5. It's quite stable when it runs. I like it, um, but it's also quite limited in what it can do. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do, but there's also a lot of things you cannot do. and Specifically, if you're really into uh, deep data analysis, uh, MT4 is a bit more difficult because you would have to program most of your um, maybe machine learning and so on uh, yourself, uh, which is not necessarily an easy task. But yes, as I said before, uh, a lot of traders offer it. So it's a good way to begin algo trading. Um, another really good uh, entry level uh, system um, and broker that, that many, many people uh, use to get into algorithmic trading is um, Interactive Brokers, IB. IB has an API uh, that can be used. Um, and nowadays uh, there's a few uh, Python packages that uh, write a wrapper around this API that makes using the API a lot simpler. Uh, one is called IB in sync. Um, and it just helps you to write your programs in a more simple way. However, um, even even though uh, this is a, a slightly easier, uh, IB is not simple to use as such. Um, why? Because it's got uh, this overnight shutdown where, where it just uh, um, locks you out of the server for overnight maintenance, and it's difficult to deal with. Oftentimes, you get a data stream from IB, but the data points don't come through very well or, or the, the data uh, center switches off for some time and you don't get any price data coming in. And in your code, you have to deal with it. And so it's quite easy that the code goes a little bit out of hand. Um, and it's, it's tricky to write, uh, admittedly. But what's really nice about IB is for retail trader that their commissions are quite low. Um, their market access is reasonably fast uh, f as far as um, um, retail goes. And uh, the other thing is they trade a wide, wide range of asset classes. They basically trade pretty much all available asset classes for retail. And also they have access to a lot of markets across the world. And that's, that's something that is uh, really, really positive about IB. Um, so, you know, I'm not associated with them. Um, so if you want, check them out. As I said, it's a bit tricky to um, to build uh, something on their platform, but but it's definitely um, doable. Okay, so, so another one, if you want to get into algo trading that I should really um, mention is uh, cryptos. Um, so I'm not necessarily trading cryptos um, because of the liquidity. Or, well, there's good liquidity, but 
but there's not a lot of uh, volume for for professional trading but cryptos are amazing because uh, a lot of the crypto exchanges have really easy to use uh, APIs. You can just build some relatively simple code and start trading your uh, automated systems. A lot of uh, this is available on GitHub. You don't have to set up complicated accounts. You don't have to go through procedures and you can just start doing it. And it's a really, really good way to learn the trade to, to, to actually start to to understand what algo trading is all about. And I wouldn't risk all my life savings straight away. I can definitely tell you that it's it's not a good idea. Um, but you can actually start trading cryptos with very, very small amounts of money. And you could literally start making trades for a few cents and see what happens. It's really worth uh, giving it a shot and really learning your um, skills uh, that way. Um, and it makes it makes it pretty easy. Um, so here we go. That's uh, the retail uh, part of it. Um, there's some there's some other things. Um, um, so if you're a bit more uh, on the professional side uh, of trading, um, one interesting um, platform that I use myself is Trading Technologies TT. TT is interesting because it has a um, something called ADL, uh, I think it's called Algo Description Language. It's basically a um, language where you don't have to write code. It's all uh, done in little boxes and you, you can pull them together and basically build your algos. Now, uh, that ADL is a little bit limited to execution algos. And so you can't really run a, a signal-driven algorithm it's it's possible but it's it's not very good very easy to use but um, you can do it um, if you try but if you want to do this um, TT also offers several other um, options like a C sharp API um, which I've been um, using uh, lately quite a bit um, it's it's very nice um, you you know it's fairly fast you can co-locate your algorithms um, and um, yeah it's a good good professional tool. It also has its hiccups, of course, has, has things that don't work so well, but in general, um, it's it's a more professional tool and, and also obviously for that reason, quite a lot more expensive than say uh, trading through IB API or MT4 or something like this. Um, another tool is uh, CQG. Um, CQG also is similar to TT, but probably a bit more on the retail side is a little bit cheaper but as far as i know through cqg you can also trade um equities whereas in tt um there are most uh, you can mostly just trade uh, futures and options so tt doesn't work for equities but as i hear you can actually now trade some cryptos uh, through tt as well which, which is quite interesting for those of you who want to do professional uh, crypto trading. Um, that's that's quite a bit I know. There's there's other platforms as well. There's there's Ninja Trader, um, um, Ami Broker. Um, it's another platform. I haven't really used those. Some people seem to use them and are quite happy with them. There's also um, something called TradeStation. Um, a friend of mine, Andrea, uh, used TradeStation quite a bit um, and he was three times a futures trading world champion, so he can't be too wrong using it. Um, there's also um, a multi charts, and there's a lot of other um, platforms that you could use. Um, but unfortunately, I can't cover them here all. But um, there's there's plenty out there, and it really depends um, where you're coming from, how much money you have. So just to reiterate, if you have very little money, start with Bitcoin or, or, or cryptos. If you have a bit more money to spend, um, um, try MT4. If you have a little bit more money yet, uh, interactive brokers is good. And if you want to go much, much bigger, then go to CQG and TT. And I think then you already um, have a good coverage. Another one that we use in Australia here for equities is called Iris. Iris is an interesting one. It's got a bit contrived API. It's not that easy to use, but 
IRIS really um, covers a wide range of, of Australian equities. It's very stable and yeah, great tool uh, to use for Australia. All right, so I hope this answers your question and then I wanna move on uh, to the next question. Um, how can we use machine learning or deep learning to reduce portfolio risk? All right, now that's um, a very uh, wide uh, range question. Um, well, there's uh, probably a lot to, to be said about this. Um, so to start with, um, I would like to uh, probably uh, point you to a book um, by Marcos Lopez de Prado. Um, um, so I just write his name here. So he's a he's one of the uh, gurus of of um, uh, uh, machine learning in trading and finance, um, and he wrote a book called Advances in um, Advances in uh, Machine Learning for Finance or F Advances in Financial uh, Machine Learning, uh, uh, so on. And um, he's got some very interesting approaches. Um, regarding uh, portfolio um, portfolio management uh, using machine learning and um, I need to need to think about this a little bit but if if I understand right he's got this um, idea that that instead of using a typical mean variance portfolio he uses something called I think it's called a hierarchical portfolio optimization so he builds um, decision trees and then bisects those trees uh, equal e in equal sizes and does that over and over again. And what he then does is he can weight the portfolio weights more accurately. Uh, as you might know is that in mean variance portfolios, because we have this dependency um, of one over sigma, so, so the, the inverse of, of our um, of our volatility that can lead to quite high position concentrations if we're not careful. Of course, this, this is the uh, uh, most basic way of constructing a portfolio, but now uh, those those methods uh, that uh, Marcos Lopez de Prado uh, proposes, uh, he says that they are um, more robust out of sample. So he doesn't necessarily claim that they produce the most amazing backtests, but but uh, from what I read is um, they use these methods, they apply them, and they got a bit more uh, robustness uh, by for managing the risk uh, out of sample. So 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 when when it comes to actual live trading, um, I really. Um, I really recommend you checking out this book. There is just, it's full of really interesting treasures. It's actually called Advances in Financial Machine Learning, as far as I remember. And it's it's really one of the great books. And you don't necessarily have to read everything, but but uh, you can uh, really get inspired uh, by using it and, and getting an idea of, um, of what is, uh, what is in there? Um, so once when you read through the chapters, like specifically the one on uh, portfolio management, um, you will see there's there's a lot to it. And he's also got the code in his book, um, and so you can just follow along the code. I've actually uh, built it myself uh, as well, and it worked quite fine. Um, and yeah, yeah, if if you're interested, check this out. Okay, then uh, another question. Hey Tom, it's Charlie. Hey, hope you are well. Can you recommend which markets are easier to find opportunities uh, due to inefficiencies? All right. Hi, hey, uh, that's a really interesting uh, question, Charlie. And um, of course, it's it's not an easy question to to answer. So um, the thing is, when markets get traded more and more heavily, um, then a market, especially with, with let, let's say high frequency trading, the markets approach more and more the property of a random walk. And when we have random walks, um, then we cannot really consistently make uh, money from this because every single um, price change is just random. And so what we want is 
a market that is less efficient and behaves less than random walk so we can find opportunities in those markets now interestingly uh, different markets uh, lend themselves to different inefficiencies and um, maybe i can just um, give you a few examples so for example uh, traditionally uh, futures markets uh, have been well known to be trending markets and so the inefficiency there is, is really trend and there's a lot of trend followers that just trade commodities and you probably heard of the term CTA commodity trading advisor which is basically a hedge fund for futures and those guys have been trading trend following strategies uh, for the last 30 or so years um, there are actually some interesting um, um, blogs online um, on uh, trend following um, there's a there's a blog called oops I need to um, need to think about it um, but there's a truck blog completely dedicated to uh, trend following and oh yeah it's called top traders unplugged top traders unplugged it's completely uh, about trend following and and it basically they talk about how to exploit the inefficiencies in the commodities market another market that is actually inefficient in its own right is uh the chinese market so what's interesting there is that the chinese market is very driven at least at the moment by retail and the inefficiencies are quite different from the inefficiencies say in commodities trading so um in the Chinese market, it's actually quite hard to apply systematic trading. Uh, and I, interestingly, I once ran a bunch of statistical randomness tests uh, over uh, parts of the Chinese market and then compared it to the same randomness tests in the US market, in the US equities market. And what I found was that I think there was about 20 tests and in the US uh, about six, about 70 percent uh, 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 basically passed uh, the randomness test so it said oh the market is random but 30 percent of those in the US market said oh the market is not random whereas in the Chinese market I think 95 percent almost all of the um, all of the randomness tests basically said the Chinese market is random but there's things that if you know them um, they could be quite interesting so for example um, there's this famous thing that in China uh, eight is a lucky number and so uh, if you have uh, a equities price that is uh, has got the number eight then often you can expect an uptrend for some reason um, because the Chinese think it's lucky and they keep buying it uh, more than anyone else the other thing is because it's retail driven it's often um, driven by news uh, and it this creates quite a bit of momentum in the market and that could be quite interesting although uh, again this momentum is really only exploitable if you understand the news and and you act on the news so uh, it can be tricky to um, um, translate Chinese news if you're not a Chinese national but um, yeah uh, I mean that that's that's definitely something Another market that isn't quite so easy to trade, in my personal opinion, is Forex. It's extremely efficient because many, many people around the world trade it. And it's very hard to find inefficiencies in that market. They do exist, but they are not easy to find. Um, the US market has definitely got inefficiencies, uh, the US equities market. Um, but uh, they do get harder and harder to exploit uh, because of uh, many more people now running algos and high frequency traders. And so um, there is definitely um, things, but you have to really search for them and you know make sure that, that you understand it. So quite often when you um, have this, when you find inefficiencies, um, specifically in the US market what you need to do is really emphasize uh, your alg or put an emphasis in your algos on good execution because quite often um, in those equities you find uh, tradable inefficiencies but they're only good uh, when your execution is very very good and you're not getting um, really bad prices uh, for you know when you execute at the market or something like that so um try that um and it might be interesting 
I also heard, but I'm not myself uh, involved in that, is that the uh, Japanese market has uh, is very good for automated trading. Uh, it's it's very automated focused, and there's lots of opportunities uh, to be had in automated trading. But again, I'm I'm not an expert, so I can't really tell you much about that. Um, I really hope that answers your question. So that's probably uh, what we have for today. If no one has any more questions, um, we finished this Q&A session uh, for today. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And if you would like, uh, please give us a, a like or subscribe to our channel. If you have uh, more questions, um, I'm also on LinkedIn. So you can always uh, send me a message on LinkedIn and say, hey, you know, uh, can you do a Q&A session about this? And um, I will definitely do this. I hope I can do this uh, more often. Um, and perhaps as as it e evolves, um, there's uh, more and more uh, things that come out. Oh, there's another question here. All right, like, well, we can always uh, do this. Um, LSJ asks, uh, any suggestions regarding crypto derivatives trading platform? Um, well, um, I'm not an expert in this. Um, so I think that, that um, um, uh, what, what are the, uh, there's, there's a few platforms for um, uh, trading crypto futures. Um, and I've heard that there is a, quite a bunch of opportunities there. There's also options on cryptocurrencies. Um, I think the futures are actually very liquid, um, but the options, I'm not so sure. I think, is it Coinbase? Coinbase might be uh, one of the exchanges that does uh, futures on cryptos. Um, but actually that's not my, uh, that's not my specific area of expertise. Um, there's also sometimes um, a merit in trading uh, stuff that isn't quite so liquid um, because you know, you can um, you can use those inefficiencies in illiquid markets and exploit them to to your advantage. But of course, you have to be sometimes very careful because it's illiquid that has big downsides as well. Because you can uh, have big moves that go right against you and and you lose a lot of money straight away. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'm 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 not too sure about this. But I think there's two big crypto exchanges and. Um, and uh, it's worth checking them out. Uh, it would be easy to find. And and I think Bitcoin futures are definitely an interesting asset class that, that I wouldn't mind looking into uh, and see if there's some stuff. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for listening. I really appreciate that you uh, came to this uh, chat. And I hope to see you again soon next time. Um, all right. And as I say this every time, there's some more questions coming in. And since this is uh, my first session here, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to answer them and then say goodbye again. OK, so uh, Dinesh asks, do you feel um, learning data science is enough to find inefficiencies or should you also have an understanding of macroeconomics of the market? All right. Uh, that's actually a very good question because I see a lot of data scientists coming into the financial markets and what often happens is they apply a lot of machine learning and they get like these back tests that look amazing but in, in reality as soon as they start trading them um, they're not very good. Um, and why is that? Well for example uh, if you use price data say from the US market um, just the US equities market when you um, apply uh, when you when you do your testing, what you often can't see is that, say, in the morning, just just at the open, uh, your price data posts a specific price, but right at the open, there's actually a humongous amount of volatility, and the spreads are really wide. So the price that you see in your price data is probably not at all the price that you actually really get, and that makes it and and you know that can turn a strategy from looking really profitable into completely getting obliterated because most of the time unfortunately uh these movement or these these big price swings they go against you it's just uh, murphy's law um <laughs> and i've never found it violated in my own trading and so 
so when you as a data scientist when you get into um, um, finance it's it's not enough to just crunch some numbers you really got to understand the market um, to some extent um, and and for example what I just explained to you those, those little details are incredibly important uh, and it's very easy to be fooled by by just a few numbers and you think oh this this, this is really quite easy and doable and with all our, our big computer technology the other thing is that um, we quite often um, I'm saying oh we just sweep across the whole market and and we find the inefficiencies but the reality is everyone's already doing that like all the big firms that's what they do and all these these efficiencies that can be exploited through that are pretty much already ironed out and arbitraged away and the efficiencies that still exist um, are hard to find. I sometimes explain a little bit. It's like if you if you try to use a brute force algorithm to um, crack strong encryption, um, yeah, it's it's theoretically possible, but it takes um, longer than the existence of the universe to uh, find uh, the right uh, um, prime numbers uh, that crack the encryption. So it's actually similar in the market. Um, and the best way to tackle this is to have at least some understanding of the market. So for example, if you're actually starting and, and trading a little bit, even with small, with small money, you, you can already see the difficulties that might arise uh, uh, from your trading that, that you didn't necessarily expect when you just test your strategies. You know, that there's a lot more that people especially from data science, often don't consider uh, one, the biggest one is commissions and probably the second, big, second biggest one is slippage. Um, so you execute that market and the price just drifts away from you really quickly um, and you don't get the prices that you actually want. And so an algorithm is very hard to, to consider that in a, specifically in a machine learning algorithm. And therefore, it's, it's not easy to, to actually really find good opportunities. That is not to say that it doesn't work. <laughs> so personally, um, um, me and my team, we are trading algorithms based on machine learning. But all of these have some sort of economic reasoning behind them. And what I would suggest is that when you want to do this really, you learn, and I call it domain-specific knowledge, you get some solid domain-specific knowledge in what you want to trade. Once you have that, then you can leverage your machine learning very effectively uh, to exploit those opportunities. Um, and that's a much better way to go. And I can tell you from my own experience, because I come from a scientific background and a mathematical background, that uh, just going in, knowing nothing, and just trying to sweep the market and, and figure out uh, lots of things. Um, you may be lucky, of course. Uh, if you try to crack strong encryption, you may be lucky. There's a one in, I don't know, 10 to the 32 chance that you could get something, um, but it's really difficult. So uh, I hope um, that will uh, help you a little bit. Um, and thanks so much for the questions. So again, um, I haven't seen any more questions. And so I want to close this for now. Have a really good uh, day or evening or morning um, and I really hope I will see you uh, in the next session and I hope you enjoyed this. Bye-bye.